back. So last time we went over we went over an awful lot of material, but um, going to briefly review the main features of arguments. Define what what do we mean by an argument? So we have a pretty clear definition of what we mean by an argument. An argument for us is a finite sequence of sentences that's intended to rationally convince an audience of some claim. So notice what's what are some of the critical points here? Well, we have to figure out, we'll talk a little bit about what a sentence is. We're going to be interested later on primarily in specific kinds of sentences. Those sentences will be called declarative sentences. Uh, we're interested in a finite sequence of sentences, so an infinitely long string of sentences won't count as an argument. Uh, we're interested in rationally convincing rather than irrationally persuading. So we talked last time about forms of irrational, irrational forms of persuasion, like advertising, for example, or social pressure, coercion of various kinds. Those would be irrational ways of persuading or convincing someone. Um, an argument is directed at an audience. We're going to be interested in what the relationship to an audience is and how audiences affect arguments. Um, and then accepting some claim would be accepting the conclusion of the argument. We'll talk in more detail about what, what these parts are as we go forward. So okay, so not every sentence, not every exchange of ideas will count as an argument. So not everything is an argument. We talked about how directions to the park or shopping lists or commands, make me a sandwich is not an argument. You know, do it or I'll kick you is not a sandwich or an argument, <laughs> okay? So all of these things aren't arguments per se. They're not sequences of sentences that are intended to convince people of some claim. And we talked about common sense, and we talked about how we have to start with common sense, and we gave some examples of obviously bad arguments. So in the case of obviously bad arguments, we're thinking about arguments that common sense detects <coughs> a problem in, right? So you're using common sense, and you know that there's something wrong when you say everyone has the right to privacy, but teenagers don't have the right to privacy. There's an obvious contradiction in that, right? So common sense sees that contradiction. Okay. Similarly, we talked about emotional appeals. I'm sure that Sally is faithful to me. Well, why are you so sure? Well, it would break my heart if Sally were cheating on me. So there's no way she's cheating on me. Obviously, the victim's emotional condition would be relevant to that argument. Right? So that's an appeal to emotion that's clearly flawed. So common sense captures these, these kinds of errors. And this is where we start. We see, for example, that you know, uses of threats or violence or coercion, these aren't good ways of, of making arguments, right? So be good or you'll go to hell is not a good argument for being good, right? That's coercion or use of a threat of violence, right? Okay, so common sense catches all of this, right? So this is where we start in a class like this, in reason and argument. We start with our innate adult level common sense, the basic capacities that let us get through every day. Non sequiturs is another case, and we'll skip this. So it's clearly, there's clearly a problem if you say Lucas is ugly, therefore Lucas is smart. That's not a good argument, right? That's what we call a non sequitur. Non sequitur means it just doesn't follow from the premises. The conclusion just doesn't follow, et cetera. You can look at these yourself. <coughs> so we're going to have to go beyond common sense, as we'll see. So common sense isn't enough for the kinds of challenges that we face. So unaided or unassisted common sense won't be good enough for you to be a good critical thinker. So we begin by figuring out, okay, well, what is it that we're looking at in arguments? And in order to do that, we have to start breaking arguments up a little bit. First, we notice that there's a structure to arguments. There's a structure to all arguments. They have premises and they have conclusions, right? So there's premises, the assumptions or the starting point of the argument, 
There are inferences, those are the moves in the argument, and then there's the conclusion, the thing that you're headed towards, the claim that you're headed towards. Okay? Now what we're going to have to do is figure out the parts of the argument, figure out how the inferences work, and then we're going to have two projects of evaluation. We're going to be evaluating the quality of the premises, and we're going to be evaluating the quality of the inferences. With the premises, we're going to be checking to see whether they're true or false, whether they're acceptable or unacceptable premises. So what's our evidence in support of accepting the premises? With the inferences, we're going to be checking whether they're legal inferences or not legal inferences, whether they're good moves or not good moves. So essentially what we're doing here is we're saying we have these inferences. Those are the moves. And the inferences are what moves our reasoning along from the shared common starting points, from the starting points, the premises or the assumptions of the argument, to, to the conclusion and to the acceptance of the conclusion. All right, so some ways of moving are good and some ways are bad, as we'll see. If you accept the truth of the premises, if you accept the truth of the premises and you accept the legitimacy of the inferences, then you are compelled, you're rationally compelled to accept the conclusion. So if the, if the premises, if the assumptions are true, if all the steps are legal steps, they're good steps, and if they lead to a conclusion, then you have to accept the conclusion on pain of irrationality. Even if you don't like the conclusion. So these are the two core virtues of arguments that we're going to be investigating. The truth of the premises and the legitimacy of the inferences. And again, for folks who are writing this down, you don't have to write this down because everything, the audio and the slides will be posted to Blackboard, okay? So you don't have to write this stuff down, okay? So what we're going to be doing as ultimately, as effective critical thinkers is figuring out at this stage in the course how to identify the inferences and the premises that compose the argument. Next step, we'll be figuring out how to evaluate them and from there we'll be interested in constructing our own good arguments. All right, so here's the argument we ended with last time and the bottom got cut off, but we'll see the bottom of the next page. All right, so this is an argument to the effect that you shouldn't be afraid of death or that it's incorrect to fear death, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna run through the argument. We're gonna identify what the assumptions are. We're going to determine whether or not we're gonna do this privately so you can do this. Whether you agree with the, the premises or the assumptions. So notice there are five premises here, right? So let's look at each of these. Do you accept them as being true? Then we're gonna look at the inferences, the inferences of the moves, and we're going to say, oh, well, do we accept the inferences as legitimate or illeg illegitimate moves? And then we're going to track through to the conclusion. And if we accept the premises as being true, these five premises, and if we accept the moves as legal moves, as good moves, then we're rationally compelled to accept the conclusion. Okay? So very roughly, this is an argument from an ancient Greek philosopher, Epicurus. And Epicurus argued, wrote in, his, in a letter to his friend, Mimesius, don't be afraid of dying. Said, you shouldn't be afraid of dying. And here's why, he said. When we're dead, we don't exist. Only things that exist can be harmed. You can't be harmed by something that hasn't happened to you. You're either alive or dead. You shouldn't fear things that are harmless. And given these five premises, he derives the conclusion, there's no need, Menesius, to worry about dying. So how does that work? Well, don't look at the board for a second and think, well, maybe do look at the board. Look at these premises. Are, are any of these premises objectionable to you? Do you find any of the premises objectionable? It would be interesting if someone did. Yeah. You do? Oh, excellent. Are you Mar Mary Kate? Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe that we cannot, oh wait, only existing things can be harmed. 
and I guess like existing is that like things that aren't alive too or like that's kind of okay so she objects to only existing things can be harmed anyone want to help her on why she might object to that yeah what's your name uh, Cody. Cody I, I think it's I, I, I kind of agree because it's generally discussing something that we would say like who are we and when we are dead in the first place is to all actually make people generally assume if we're all thinking on the same terms <coughs> that we is talking about the mental aspect, soul, whatever you want to have it, as opposed to the physical body. Oh, okay. Was that what you were, what you were thinking? Yeah. You were no. thinking that we'd exist like as a soul or something? Correct, yeah. I see. No, well, I mean, okay. So if we exist as a soul, do we exist? If I exist as a soul, do I exist? Yeah. Yes. I exist, right? I'm floating around like Casper the Friendly Ghost, right? Yeah? Okay, I'm not in my body, right? But for, for people who believe in souls and things like that, the body's like a car, you know? I'm just like driving around. Right? Okay? And then when you die, you fly out and you go to heaven. Yeah? Or hell, depending on what gentle Jesus prefers. Okay? So the soul is what Mary Kay and Drew, Cody, are uh, identifying with the person. But if the soul exists, and you're the soul, then you exist, right? OK. Have you died? OK. Uh, that's Brad. Next to Brad is Alex. Alex. Um, well, I mean, just because uh, it says when we're dead, you know, we no longer exist. Versus uh, if a dead body can easily, it says it can only, um, only existing things can be harmed. It just seems like if they're dead, you can still be harming existing things. True. So, and then it says we cannot be harmed by something that. So you'd be harm. like kicking the dead body, for well, example. I mean. Oh, if you're kicking my dead body, are you kicking me? Bodies, I was wondering, like, a diseased bot, dead body can still infect existing bodies. Excellent. Excellent. You know, for sure. And then we cannot sure. be harmed by something Very that good. happened yet. Very good. Very good. Very good. Can still be harmed by But something. you're not there, right? Not yet. Oh, you're not there after you're dead. But right. cannot means like an indefinite, like. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. These are all really nice attempts to make the premises more precise, <laughs> right? So everyone is contributing good ways of making the premises more precise, but so far none of you have disagreed with any of the premises. Am I wrong or am I right? Just makes it clearer. Makes it clearer, more precise. This is what Cody was saying. He said, well, it's not, or uh, Mary Kate was saying, it's not about like, being a disembodied soul, etc." What's your name? Uh, my name's Omar. Omar. Yeah. Um, so I'm not saying I agree nor disagree, but I think for the first premise, um, when you're dead, we no longer exist. The only thing I would pick from that is, I mean, he at this point, he's never been dead, so how would he know? Okay, okay. So he certainly doesn't doesn't know either way. Yeah. So what, are we, what would we take this to be? We would be keep taking it as sort of a definition, but death means not existence. Right? Okay. So, I mean, when you say, okay, I'm, I'm looking at someone and she's dying, right? Okay. One way of interpreting that, and I think the three of you, Cody, Mary Kate, and Omar, are both pushing for this, is, well, we don't understand what death is, right? Very good. So you're saying, Mary Kate might say that the soul leaves the body and goes to heaven or hell, or someone else might say, well, there's reincarnation, or someone else might say, I don't know, something else. <coughs> but what the three of you seem to be pointing to is a lack of clarity with respect to the nature of death, right? Yeah, that's good. So you want to make it more precise. So what, of course, Epicurus is thinking is real death. Real death meaning you're not there anymore. That's it, game over. Of course, Christians don't believe that there is real death, right? Game is never over, right? You just move on to the next level. Okay, so Raman and then we'll Raman, right? Yeah, okay. When you said when you're dead, you're no longer existing. Can you prove that the soul does not exist? Because what keeps us alive? Okay, but you notice, Raman, that that would be the claim then. What Raman is saying is that we actually never die. That the soul just moves through levels or whatever. And if we, if we never die, then should we fear death? 
No. So we shouldn't fear death. So it would be another way of proving his view, right? But then again, if you believe in the, the soul, then there are consequences to your actions if you're not doing well according to your living, then you might fear death right now. Here. Right, you might fear going to hell. Yeah. Or, right, good. That's true, but it wouldn't be death. It would just be like leaving this car and traveling like past where the friendly <coughs> goes to the floor down to hell. Yeah? Okay. All right. So Epicurus means death, a real death, not pretend death or bodily death. He means death death. Death meaning game over death. Okay. So anyway, so what we've done so far is very good. We've tried to get Epicurus to be as precise as possible about his premises. And that's an excellent starting point. And we have to do that. It's good critical thinkers. We've got to get clear on what the assumptions are. What's this person assuming? So if we accept that death means non-existence, which many of you are pressing them on correctly, right? If you accept that, and if you accept that only existing things can be harmed, which might actually be the weakest premise, Sort of an interesting one. Yeah. Depends mm -hmm. on what kind of harm. Good. Good. Depends on the kind of harm. So, for example, if I live a really happy life, if I have this fantastic life, and then I die peacefully in my bed, surrounded by my grandchildren, and then the next day, the Cossacks come and rape and kill everyone in my family, that would be a less good outcome, even though I'm not there to see it, than if they all live happily ever after, right? Would, would, it, I mean, would I prefer a world where the Cossacks don't come after I'm dead and rape and kill everyone? I would prefer that world, right? Yes. Or let's say a world where I, I let's say, imagine I've worked really hard on a scientist and I've been working really, really hard on a cure for, I don't know, acne. And I spent my entire career striving for a cure to acne. And I think I have it. And I'm you know, showered with accolades. I win the Nobel Prize for curing acne, right? And then I die happy. But then the next day it's discovered that the acne medicine gives everyone cancer, right? That would be a bad outcome, right? I would prefer that not that. Now, have I been harmed? It's an interesting question. So Epicurus would say, no, actually. You're, you haven't been harmed because you don't exist. But in some sense, Others might argue, well, what happens after I die is relevant to the value of my current life, right? A lot of the things that happen after I'm dead in my afterlife, right, after I no longer exist, are to define the quality of my current life. It's an interesting thought, right? I don't know if that's true, but it certainly seems to be the case that we would act very differently if we knew that the day after we died, the world would be destroyed. So you would have a, you would choose a very different kind of career path, probably, if you knew that the world was going to end in seven years. All right? So a lot of what we do now is built on the assumption that the human project is an ongoing project, right? Yeah? So we wouldn't pursue science or medicine, for the most part, if we thought that the entire species would be gone in a year, right? Okay. So isn't it interesting that what happens after we're dead is relevant to the value of our current projects? Okay. All right. So anyway, so maybe he's wrong about this. Maybe what happens in the future can harm a non-existent okay, day when we don't exist. What happens in our sort of afterlife can affect our current condition. Maybe he's wrong about that. Interesting. Okay, well, we're either alive or dead. That's sort of, yeah, okay. We're either alive or we're dead. Fair enough. We shouldn't fear harmless things. Interesting. By harmless here, he means things that harm us. Maybe we should fear some kinds of things even though they don't harm us. Like, we should be concerned about the future of the human species, right, after we're dead, 
even though we're not going to be here. We're not going to be harmed by what happens to the future humans. Okay? So what we're doing when we press these arguments, when we press the arguments, when we look for additional precision with the premises, is we're actually doing critical thinking. This is what it means to think critically. So you take the assumptions and you don't just say, yeah, that seems fine, that doesn't seem objectionable. You press the argument, you press the premise. And it's good. So even if ultimately you agree with Epicurus about this, even if that's where you come out, at least you'll have a more sophisticated appreciation of the argument and you'll do it for good reasons. You'll agree for good reasons. It would be terrible to agree for stupid reasons, right? So it's good to agree for good reasons. The inferences. How do the inferences work? Well, we say, for example, we're not harmed by death when we're dead because we don't exist. And how does that work? Well, it uses the first premise and the second premise. It's a move that involves the first and second premises. And we're going to spend a lot of time figuring out what these moves are and how arguments move and how these things happen. I'm going to stop talking about this argument, though, because I think we've, we've got the idea and you can look at the slides. And now we're going to talk about the two major virtues that we're interested in. So we're going to give some definitions to begin with. So valid. What does valid mean? Well, valid, so forget everything you know. We're going to start from scratch. What does valid mean? A valid argument is what? An argument is valid if it's formally correct. Okay. Now, what does it mean to say formally correct? Well, we'll see. Ultimately, what I can say for now, what you know already, is that all the moves are legal. So an argument is valid if all the moves are legal. Got it? We've got another notion, notion of soundness. And soundness is also a virtue. It works as follows. We say an argument is sound if it's both formally correct, if it's valid, and if all of its premises are true. So you can have a valid argument, notice, that has false premises. Okay? So we've got to be careful about that because that's not common usage. So you can have a valid argument. Valid means formally correct. It means all the moves are good moves. Right? But you can have good moves starting with shitty premises. Right? So if you have false premises, right? you can have a valid argument as long as the moves are all legal moves. So legal moves can take as their starting point bad or false premises. It's still valid. So sound means the moves are legal and the premises are true. Okay? So we distinguish those two notions, soundness and validity. Can you have a sound, val sound argument that's invalid? No. Can you can right? Can you have a valid argument that's not sound? Yes. Okay. So an argument is valid. What do we mean by formal correctness one more time? We mean what? We mean that it's legal, everything's legal, it's formally correct. Well, what does that mean? Well, you'll see. But one additional thing we can say is that an argument is valid if it's impossible. Now, impossible, that's super strong. That means in all possible worlds, no matter how the world turns out, an argument is valid if it's impossible, by virtue of the logical form of the argument, for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false. This is going to be sort of bedrock for this class. It's going to be impossible, in the case of a valid argument, for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false. Impossible. Impossible. So if you have true premises, the conclusion will be true and valid. So what this says, another way of putting this, is that logic is truth-preserving. Okay? Truth-preserving means if you start out with true stuff and you follow the rules, you'll never get false stuff. One more time. If you start out with true stuff, true premises, and you follow the rules, the rules will never make you false, utter a falsehood, or write down a falsehood. Everyone get that? So this is when we say logic is truth-preserving. That's what we mean. 
<coughs> so soundness is great to have. Soundness would be an extra bonus over validity. Validity is great. Soundness is even better. So it's an extra bonus point here for an argument. So what we can have, we know that we can have valid arguments with false premises, and you can also have invalid arguments. One more time. You can have invalid arguments. You can have invalid arguments with true premises. So you can have perfectly legal moves, right? Building on bad arguments, or bad premises, right? You can have valid arguments with false premises, but you can also have invalid arguments with true premises. So you can have true premises and lousy arguments built on them. Okay? We'll see a lot of those. So sound arguments are awesome. They're the ones that have both true premises and they're valid. They have the right logical form. So what do we mean by the form of the argument? Very simple. Very simple. We mean the structure, the way the thing is put together. Now, what, what gets structured? Well, what gets structured is the parts. The argument has parts, and the way they're put together is their structure. And some structures are good, and some structures aren't good. It's the shape of the argument, I say on the slide, as it moves from the premises to the conclusion. And we want to make sure that the steps are taking place according to the principles of good reason. The principles of good reason. What do we mean by that? Well, hey. Okay. So this is where we distinguish logic and formal reasoning generally from empirical science. So empirical sciences like psychology or neuroscience will tell us how the brain works or how humans tend to behave, right? So our best, I guess the best path to understanding how humans think is by, by psychology and neuroscience. So if you really want to know how we think, then you should be a neuroscientist or a psychologist. Okay? Logic is not about how we actually think. Logic is about how we should think, how we should argue. Okay? So it's not about the actual brain, the actual human brain. It's not about our actual habits our actual way of talking and thinking. Logic is about the norms that should govern our ways of thinking. In the same way that ethics is about determining what's right and wrong, right? Logic is about determining the right and wrong ways to think. And there are right and wrong ways. So logic is what we call a normative discipline. In some difficult to articulate sense. Logic is about rules. It's not about facts. It's not a matter of description. It's a matter of what thought. We're not logical. We don't think logical. We don't. So when we say, like some philosophers in the late 19th century, like Frege, said that logic is, logic is the laws of thought, in some sense, he didn't mean to say that. He didn't mean to say, certainly, logic is the laws of how we have it. So he means something like the norms governing how we ought to. Okay. All right, so this is why I use phrases like good and bad and legal or illegal. These are all sort of metaphorical, quasi-metaphorical ways of conveying the normative nature of logic. So let's look at a bad way of arguing. This is an invalid argument. So invalid, so valid, invalid, invalid means what? It means it doesn't have the right form. Yeah? Okay? It has nothing to do with the truth or falsity of the premises at this point. We're just talking about the structure. And let's look at this as an example of a, a bad piece of reasoning. So we're saying if it's raining, then the grass is wet. It isn't raining, therefore the grass isn't wet. Okay, so what's wrong with that? Using just common sense now, don't worry about logic. Just common sense. What's wrong with that? If someone gave you that argument, what's wrong with it? Someone other than Omar, someone other than Brad, someone other than Alex, someone other than, uh, no, you were down there, Cody. What's your name? Shane. 
Cherry? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Shane. Shane. Okay. Okay, Shane, tell me. What's <laughs> I can't hear it. Go ahead, Shane. Uh, someone could have dumped a bucket of water onto the grass. Very good. Very good. Very good. Okay? And what would that be? That would be what we call a counterexample. Shane, Alex, Brad, Cody, Brad. Shane. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Someone could have dumped a bucket of water, or the sprinkler system could be on, right? It could be El Paso, and they could have the sprinkler system on. It hasn't rained for months and months, <coughs> but the grass is still wet. What do we call that? We call that a counterexample. A counterexample means what? <coughs> it could be true that the grass is wet and the premises are true as well. So even though, now what do we mean by that? Remember, a valid argument is one where if the premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true. What's her name? Schwinn. Okay. So the conclusion has to be true, right? Okay, in a valid argument, if the premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true. But what if there are exceptions? What if sometimes it's not the case? Well, then it's not a valid argument. Why? Because by definition, by definition, the conclusion has to be true if the premises are true, right? Everyone see that? Okay, so a counterexample is a case where we can have the denial of the conclusion. Here, the grass is wet. As Shane said, the grass is wet because someone threw a bucket of water on the grass. Right? Okay. Now, that's true, which is a denial of the conclusion. Yeah? And the premises are still true. Therefore, it's not a valid argument. Everyone got that? You good with that? All right. So let's just break this down. Let's be redundant. If it's raining, then the grass is wet. That's the premise. Right? Everyone see that's the starting point. And so this premise is interesting, right? So this premise is what is called a conditional. And the conditional, any con a conditional is a statement that, that takes the form if, blah, blah, then, blah, blah. All right? If, blah, blah, then, muckety-muck. That's a conditional. If dot dot dot, then dot dot dot. Yeah? Okay. So the premise here is a conditional. Here's another premise. It isn't raining. That's a fact. Another premise. Let's just assume that the, the speaker is trustworthy. So the speaker has given us two facts. The oracle, in this case, has given us two facts. If it's raining, then the grass is wet. Seems reasonable. And it isn't raining. Here we've got the conclusion, the grass isn't wet, and do I have the inference? No. And the inference is the move, the therefore. Okay? So if it's raining, then the grass is wet. It isn't raining. Those are the premises. Therefore, that's the move. The grass isn't wet. That's the conclusion. Simple argument. Yeah? It's a lousy argument. It's a lousy argument because we know that there are counterexamples. How do we know that? At this point, because Shane said so, and he's got a fair share of common sense. Yeah? Okay, so we just used common sense. But now we'll, as we go further, we'll learn for real why it's a bad argument. All right, so yeah, so this is where the move happens, the therefore. So remember, an argument is valid if it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. Can the premise be true and the conclusion false? Shane says yes. Counterexample. The sprinkler system was turned on. The grass isn't wet, and it isn't, the grass is wet, rather, and it isn't raining. Okay? Simple. Anyone, any questions about that? Counterexample? No? Okay. So we've encountered with this example our first fallacy. So this is the first fallacy. What's a fallacy? Fallacy just means bad reasoning. Okay? That piece of bad reasoning. We're going to have a whole 
arsenal, a whole inventory of fallacies by the end of this class. You're going to be, you're going to become so annoying at home, right? When you go home for for break, you're going to be a, just a, a hated person because every every 20 minutes you're going to say, oh, that's the fallacy of denying the antecedents. That's the straw man fallacy. That's the slippery slope fallacy. That's the this fallacy. That's the that fallacy. You won't be able to resist it because you're like the power of education. So happy to proud of yourself, and you'll be telling everyone where they're messing up, and you'll it'll it'll just be you'll become really hateful. So don't don't do that. You can do it. It's fun. You'll get over it pretty quickly. And you can start getting care of it. But what you're going to be doing is detecting almost. Invariably, inevitably, you're going to be detecting fallacies in the things you read, the things you pick up on Facebook, the things you hear from the media, etc. It's just going to be fallacy after fallacy. And you're going to be just, I hope, you're going to be so tuned to this that you're just not going to be able to listen to the news or watch the television or Facebook will be a nightmare. See all the fallacies. The, every, the status updates, the, the history is just like a string of fallacies. One fallacy after another fallacy. <coughs> so, okay, so that's what you can look forward to. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so a fallacy here is just an example of how not to argue. So, the first fallacy we're looking at here is the fallacy of denying the antecedent. That's the name, don't worry too much about it. We'll see this over and over again. Um, and. The fallacy of denying the antecedent is very easily, uh, let me give you another example. So the example uh, runs as follows. Um, if, um, if Jessica studies all night, then she'll be tired. Okay. Jessica didn't study all night. Therefore, she's not tired. Okay? One more time. If Jessica studies all night, then she'll be tired. If Jessica didn't study all night. Therefore, Jessica is not tired. What's wrong with that? And when you're, when you're trying to figure out what's wrong with it, think of the counter example. Mary. Mary. She could have been watching movies. She could have been watching movies. She could have run a marathon. She could have been at the gym. She and been tired for any number of reasons. So the fact that she wasn't studying doesn't license you to conclude that therefore she's not tired. Right? Good, so that's the fallacy of denying the antecedent. What do we mean by the antecedent? The antecedent is the first part of a conditional. So if A then B is the conditional, right? If Jessica was studying, then Jessica will be tired. The antecedent is A, Jessica was studying. The consequent is B, Jessica is tired, right? Okay. So denying the antecedent means not A, therefore not B, and that's wrong. And that'll be important if we get to what I want to get to today in the class, that'll be important at the end. Um, so any questions about that? No? No? Good. All easy? Simple? Simple? At the back? Yes? Good. Conclusion could be false, given the premises are true, therefore it's invalid. We get the idea. All right, how about this one? How about this one? Gang members have tattoos, and Jesse has a tattoo. So Jesse's a gang member. What's wrong with that? What's your name? Drew, Mary, Fred, Alex, <coughs> Shane, Corey, Drew? Yeah. All right. Uh, a lot of people have tattoos that aren't gangs. What if it's a law of nature that all gang members have tattoos? Like, as soon as you become a gang member, it disappears on you? The law of nature? That doesn't really matter. Good. That doesn't matter. Why, Drew? Nice enough. Uh, just because everyone that is in a gang has a tattoo doesn't mean that everyone has a tattoo. Okay. Very good. Very good. Everyone follow that? Okay, that's a nice one. Good job, Drew. 
All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to, so okay, we feel pretty good. Everyone feels all right? Okay, so now we're going to do a logic puzzle. And this is very simple. This is the simplest thing. It actually comes from my kid's fourth grade workbook, a variation on what's in my kid's fourth grade workbook. Okay, so it should be easy for you guys. Let's, let's, uh, let's look at this. Imagine that the population of three Midwestern cities, Des Moines, Wichita, and Columbus, is relevant to your business. So you don't have access to the internet, so you can't just look it up. But you do know that their populations are 800,000, 200,000, and 386,000. Okay? You also know that Des Moines has fewer than 300,000 people, and that Wichita is not the largest. So what's the population of Wichita? Don't say it, but you can do it in your head, right? You can do it super easy in your head. Yeah? Yeah? I pick on people. Okay, do it then. Do it in your head. Or do it on paper. Super easy, right? Now, the challenge is, or the question now, what we're going to look at is, how did you do that? How did you figure that out? How did you figure it out? Okay, because you've all figured it out. I hope. Anyone not figured it out? Embarrass yourself. Raise your hand. Embarrass yourself now. No? Okay, so you've all figured it out. So how did that happen? What is the population of Wichita? Tell me. Okay. Okay. So you figured that out. Why? Well, it's easy, right? So we've got this space of possibilities. This is the way these logic puzzles work. So like the GRE, the LSAT, the GMAT, etc., have more complicated versions of this. But it's basically you're, you're given a space of possibilities. You've got three cities and three values of population, right? Yeah. And what you do is you reason. You take the evidence that you have. So you know that Des Moines is less than 300,000. So yeah, OK, that's where that goes. Now you know that if Des Moines is here, then Wichita can't be there too. And you know that Columbus can't be there too. I mean, there might be a wildly, it might be a wild coincidence that they have exactly the same population. It's highly improbable. They have the same population, right? So you can rule out. Wichita is having that population and Columbus is having that. And you can also rule out that it has more than one population. So no, no, right? OK, now that, that's an inference. Okay? You did a piece of reasoning. You made a move. Then you said, OK, well, Wichita is not the biggest. I'll just redo that for you. So I know it's not going to be under the 800,000 category. So that means what's going to be down here? that Columbus has to be the one, right? Yeah? In Wichita, you know, <coughs> if it can't be that one, if it can't be this and this on the first um, row, then it has to be this, <coughs> right? And then, of course, it fills itself in like Sudoku, right? Sort of like Sudoku. OK, so what you're doing when you're doing this is you're, you're making inferences based on the information that you, the premises that you're given. Perfectly simple. So what I wanted you to see is just how the deductive process works. But now, and you should be feeling pretty good about yourself, now you're going to feel bad about yourself. In the next slide, we're all going to feel bad about ourselves. Now we're going to look at something called the waste and selection task. If you're familiar with this from a psychology class or whatever, just be quiet. Don't participate. Okay? But what's the waste and selection task? It's, in some sense, more, it's simpler than this. Look how many, look how many possible spots there are on this. It's a, it's a big space of possibilities, actually, that you navigated, right? Here's the waste and task. You're given a rule, and you're asked now, the rule is given on the board, you're asked, how can you figure out if the rule applies to this sample, okay? How can you figure out if the rule applies to this sample? What's the sample? The sample is four cards. And on one side of the card is a color. And on the other side of the card is a number. Okay? So on one side of the card, you'll find a number. There are four cards in front of you on the table. Two turn to their colors. Two turn to their numbers. You're given a rule. The rule says, what did I say for the rule? If a card has seven on one side, then the other side is blue. <coughs> so if A, then B. Again, what do we call that kind of rule? A, B. 
Conditional. Excellent. What's your name? Zoe. Zoe. Excellent. My daughter's name is Zoe. Okay. So, uh, the state of New Mexico didn't let us put the two dots over the E. Yeah. 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 So Zoe. So okay. So. This is the rule. If the card has a seven on one side, then the other side is blue. Okay, so how are you going to check to see whether that rule holds for this side? <coughs> Hold on, Brad. I don't want anyone answering out loud. I just want you to try to try to think about it. Write it down. Write down your best guess. How are you going to do this? So write down your best guess. Now you're in a reason and argument class. And we, we're talking about psychology of reasoning here, so you can probably assume that you're going to that most people get this wrong. Yeah, seventy-five percent, roughly, of people get this wrong, and so you're probably going to get it wrong. So that means think twice, right? Okay, so I would anticipate about fifty percent of us will get it right. Okay, so please give your best answer. Which cards do I need to turn over? Card one, card two, card three, or card four? <coughs> Which one do I need to turn over in order to, to check? Or it's some combination. Keep your hands down. Just write it down. Got it? Yeah? Yeah? OK. We done? Now don't be disappointed if you get this wrong. 75% of people get this wrong. And in the original test, it was 90%. Wayson was getting like 90% error rates. And these were, you know, Ivy League students, from Ivy League students all the way down to, to kids in high school. So, you see that? Okay, so, so I'm dying to know what you, this would be when you really handed out those clicker things, you know, those clicker classrooms. All right, but you write down what you have on your thing. And then you can scratch it out, no one see. All right. So, if a card has a seven on one side, then the other side is blue. Should I take the blue card? Yes. Should I take the seven? Yes. yes. No. Okay. I'm gonna take you back. <laughs> okay, take it back, take it back. That's what that's that's the trouble with us. We're that's our, this is a power of situation. But it turns out that the blue card, Roman, is totally irrelevant to the rule. Why? Because what does the rule say? If a card is seven on one side, then the other side is blue. Right? Does it say anything about other ways the card could be blue? No. No. This is going to be called the, the fallacy of affirming the consequence. Mm -hmm. So, just Ram is super smart, obviously. But he made that mistake, and we all do. Most of us do. Why? Because there's a very strong association between the consequence being blue and whether or not the rule holds. But it turns out that you could turn the blue card and you can have a three on it, and the rule would still hold. OK, right? so what do we turn over then, other than Brad? Yes, ma'am, what's your name? Katie. Say it again? Katie. OK. Oh, the seven. The seven. So if we turned over the seven and it wasn't blue, then the rule would be false. OK, good. How about the five? Is the five relevant to the rule? No. Why? Because you could turn the five over and it'd be blue, and it wouldn't falsify the rule, right? Because the rule says, I'm getting a sort of blank stare. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Yes? No, the woman next to you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you got it. Right. So the five, if you turn the five over and it was blue, it still wouldn't falsify the rule. Okay. So we got the seven. What about the green? Interesting. Good. Say, say your name. Right. Exactly. What's your name? Madeline. Madeline. Madeline says you've got to turn the.